Thank you all for coming to this uh, afternoon uh, DEFCON session about the adventures of uh, AV in the Leaky, Leaky Sandbox. Uh, to, together with me, we have here uh, Itzi Kotler, the CTO and co-founder of SafeBridge, and yours truly is the VP Security Research of SafeBridge. So, what, what we are going to cover today uh, is uh, exfiltration from highly secure enterprise. We are talking about uh, mainly uh, two uh, scenarios. One wherein uh, the uh, enterprise has its endpoint endpoints with uh, restricted internet access. That means that only uh, traffic uh, to a closed set, very small closed set of uh, whitelisted hosts are allowed uh, per endpoint. Such hosts can be, for example, Windows update servers, antivirus servers, and so forth, hosts that are really needed for the proper functioning of the uh, endpoint. And the second variant is even uh, stricter, wherein endpoints simply do not have any internet access whatsoever. They do have, of course, visibility into the enterprise network, wherein a set of uh, update and management servers uh, reside on a separate uh, LAN segment that are allowed to access uh, internet uh, hosts so that the endpoints eventually pull uh, or, or get pushed with uh, Windows updates and antivirus updates from the management servers uh, that, that reside on-premise. So let's say now that the, instead of the traditional antivirus, we have cloud-enhanced antivirus. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of people now are, very, now are in love with uh, the whole cloud uh, theme, wisdom of the clouds and so forth. And obviously, a uh, cloud enhancement is, as the name uh, implies, an enhancement. What can possibly go wrong? So we say that, yes, something can go wrong. Adding cloud antivirus can degrade the security of the endpoint. How? Like we said, we are going to exfiltrate data from the enterprise. Again, we are assuming that they, we are talking about highly secure enterprise with restricted or no direct internet connection for the endpoints. And we're going to use the cloud antivirus to ex actually exfiltrate data from the endpoint where with traditional antivirus, we could not achieve this goal. An important property of our attack is that the attacker can be anywhere in the internet. There's no a uh, requirement for the attacker to be in proximity, either geographic or uh, network topology-wise. So, for example, we're not talking about necessarily an attacker that resides on the same ISP or that attacker that owns ISP servers and so forth. The attacker can practically be anywhere on the internet. And the feature of the cloud antivirus that we are going to exploit is the antivirus sandbox. Now, uh, before I describe the technique, we're going to go very quickly on some related work to make sure that we understand the context of this new attack. So obviously, exfiltration at large uh, is already known and researched for several decades with lots of works covering uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, exfiltration techniques. All those exfiltration techniques assume unrestricted internet connection. Clearly, this is not the case uh, in the scenarios that we uh, look at. Uh, also, there's a lot of work on uh, air-gapped endpoints, the other extremities, but uh, and it's great and amusing work from a Ben Gurion University research group. But all those attacks require eventually that the attacker is in close physical proximities, can be either somewhere between meters and hundreds of meters from the uh, uh, network. This is again a very restricting a most restricting requirement that we do not uh, have in our technology. Uh, there are some works on third-party sites, uh, on exfiltration via third-party sites that could have been theoretically be applied in this situation where the third-party site uh, is the update server for one, for, uh, for Microsoft or from the antivirus, but from reason that we uh, go into in details in our white paper, uh, all those techniques are irrelevant because we are talking about an update server, not a regular uh, uh, browsing website, uh, not a regular uh, website. Um, there's a lot of research, of course, on antivirus sandboxes. Uh, 
this great research uh, discussing all kind of properties of uh, antivirus sandboxes. But um, all that research, uh, all that research leaked data from the sandboxes themselves, not from the endpoint of uh, an enterprise. So again, uh, lovely research, but does not help directly in our case. Um, and of, there's one case of Tavis or Mandy uh, leaking data from the endpoint using the a Komodo sandbox, but again, uh, this research uh, assumed that there is no uh, restriction on the internet connections from the endpoint, so again, less relevant in our case. And so we really are uh, convinced that this is uh, a new and uh, much uh, uh, improved uh, attack over uh, existing uh, techniques and technologies. So here is the technique that uh, we devised. We need two building blocks. One is the ability uh, for a malicious code to trigger an antivirus event. Uh, and uh, in one of the previous links uh, in one of the, in, in the slides uh, that I just uh, went through, has a very nice compilation of uh, such a triggering uh, of techniques to trigger an antivirus product. Uh, and due to time restrictions, we only used two very simple triggers. One is writing the iCAR file to disk. iCAR file is a standard 68 bytes, a non-Window 32 executable file that is uh, by definition supposed to be detected by each and every antivirus uh, product. The other one is installing, uh, is, is having the malware install itself or persist itself on the machine, on the machine in question, on the endpoint, by uh, moving or copying its binary to under the Windows startup folder. Of course, there are tons of other uh, uh, triggering uh, techniques. These are but very simple two techniques, but even with those two simple techniques, we got uh, a very uh, uh, an interesting and, and meaningful results. The second building block is simply exfiltrating data from an internet connected machine with no internet uh, restriction or with reasonable internet uh, restrictions. Again, there are multiple ways of doing that. Uh, the slide about exfiltration at large lists some uh, three uh, papers that provide compilation of such uh, techniques. And again, due to time restrictions, we had to limit ourselves to only two techniques. One is simply sending an HTTP or HTTPS request to the attacker host where the uh, HTTP body section contains the uh, data to be exfiltrated. And the second one is slightly more sophisticated and it involves forcing a DNS resolution to an attacker on domain and uh, using a subdomain that contains the data to be exfiltrated. Of course, the subdomain can only contain a small chunk of such data. So a series of DNS queries uh, are needed effectively to exfiltrate large amounts of data. And the idea here is that uh, using DNS resolution or by forcing a DNS resolution, resolution using get host by name or get ADDR info, the malware for, tells the operating system to resolve this host name. The, host, the operating system uses its uh, configured a DNS resolver to, to, do the, to actually do the resolution. And the DNS resolver has to do all the uh, hard uh, DNS work, starting from the root server, uh, theoretically, and going all the way through the uh, authoritative name server that is owned by the attacker and which is served by the attacker's authoritative name server. So the final uh, step in resolution has the DNS resolver sending the host name to the uh, authoritative DNS server owned by the attacker, and the attacker just need to extract the uh, subdomain or the host name, uh, the, the host part of the, uh, of the DNS name, and assemble it, uh, collect all those uh, queries, assemble them, and get them, uh, deserialize them uh, back into the original uh, message, the data to be exfiltrated. 
So, and now I'm going to describe the technique. Um, again, as the assumptions that we uh, make are that we have an antivirus product, an agent installed on endpoints, um, and it submits uh, samples to the antivirus cloud. <clears throat> this submission can be directly by establishing a connection to the uh, antivirus uh, server or indirectly by uh, sending this uh, file to the antivirus management server and have the management server send it uh, to the antivirus uh, cloud. And the cloud service uses a sandbox which can directly connect to the internet. That's the secret sauce of the, uh, oh, part of the secret sauce. And the attacker process is, uh, or malware is assumed to be already running on the endpoint. How do we get a, a an endpoint to be infected in the first place is out of scope uh, for this research. Obviously, we can use uh, several techniques. And I'm sure that you're familiar and, and, and don't need to really uh, uh, go over the, uh, the techniques for infection, but in this case, Think, for example, about an uh, infected or uh, malicious uh, USB stick. <clears throat> and the attack flow goes as following. Uh, we are going to use two components. One is the main malware. We call it the rocket. The rocket <clears throat> is responsible for the data collection, the sensitive data collection. It can collect uh, documents, uh, PowerPoint uh, slides, uh, uh, Excel files, uh, database queries and database files, and whatnot from the uh, endpoint. And the rocket contains a, a copy inside it, inside the, the binary, inside the process, me uh, the process memory. <coughs> it contains a small, a, a small additional executable we call the satellite. And uh, the satellite uh, is responsible for the actual exfiltration. It has logic for uh, triggering an, an, the antivirus agent, and also it has logic uh, for a, a generic exfiltration. So as, as we said, the assumption, the, st the first, the, the zero step, is to have the machine, the endpoint infected uh, with the main malware of the rocket. As you can see, the rocket contains uh, the satellite inside it. Then the rocket, co the rocket collects the sensitive data from the endpoint and embeds it into the satellite. The satellite has inside its own binary, the satellite has a static buffer pre-allocated and into this buffer, the rocket writes the sensitive data to be exfiltrated. So, or let's call it the payload. Then the rocket writes the satellite with the collected data inside it to disk and executes it using, for example, a system or any other standard execution method. So now two malicious processes are running side by side. The original main malware, the rocket, and the satellite, which contains inside its binary, uh, form the collected data. Now the satellite runs its uh, triggering uh, logic, and so it triggers the antivirus agent. The antivirus agent maybe quarantines the satellite or stops the satellite, but also sends this, uh, this sample uh, to the cloud for further inspection. Now in the cloud, the antivirus server opens this uh, sample into a sandbox and runs it inside the sandbox. The sandbox, I remind you, is, uh, allows some form of internet connection. And so the satellite uses this uh, internet connection to send the data to the uh, attacker's command and control server. We have uh, a market share uh, research from Opswat showing uh, 11 uh, leading uh, antivirus vendors. We, again, due to time uh, restrictions, we only tested 10 of them. We uh, had to omit uh, SpyBot. And the results are that Avira, Antivirus Pro, ESET, uh, Node32, Kaspersky Total Security, and Komodo Client Security were found vulnerable to this uh, attack technique. So four out of 10. 
Do notice that this attack technique is not too subtle. We are triggering an antivirus agent, so we're expecting some pop-ups and logs and, rec and, and audits and whatnot. But it's also, it's uh, at the same time, too late for the enterprise to uh, react. The data is already on its way to the cloud, and once it gets executed, uh, sometimes within seconds, uh, the data is ex uh, practically exfiltrated. While doing this research, uh, we got uh, we co we uh, collected a lot of uh, insights on cloud antivirus sandboxes. <coughs> and the, some some sandboxes like ESET blocked HTTP but not DNS. Some sandboxes blocked access to environment variables. So when we try to enumerate them, we'd get an empty list. Some have non-standard software and environment variables. We'll see an example shortly. Um, of interest is the fact that the, the, the somewhat surprising fact that cloud antivirus sandboxes do not try to hide themselves. Uh, in almost all of them, at least one of the below list was uh, static or indicative of, uh, of sandboxing. Uh, the computer name, disk volume serial number, MAC address, which is either static or indicative of sandboxing, like for example, VMware, uh, the VMware uh, uh, vendor MAC, and performance counter frequency, which again can be indicative of uh, sandboxing. Some sandbox infrastructure is shared among several vendors. Um, lead time, time from a submission to getting data exfiltrated, varied wildly. Uh, we have sub-minutes, actually. We had some cases where it took 10 or 20 seconds to cases where it took uh, two or two, three hours. Um, of, also of peculiarity is that we saw some cases where multiple executions uh, were carried out. So we assume, or we, we kind of assume that when a sample is uploaded to the sandbox, is uploaded to, to the cloud, it gets executed once in the sandbox. Well, clearly that's not always the case. Sometimes it is executed multiple times. And finally, uh, and somewhat amusing is that some antivirus uh, agents also uh, get started getting suspicious about the rocket, the main malware, and they noticed that this main malware contains a small executable inside it. So they extracted this small executable, the satellite, in its vanilla form, that is uh, before uh, data was embedded into it, and executed it in, in executed or sand, executed the, this vanilla sandbox in it, vanilla I'm sorry satellite inside the sandbox. So at first it was a great surprise, but later we figured out what's going on. Um, we uh, extracted 37 sandbox sample uh, sandbox computer names. Uh, and, of, uh, and somewhat interestingly, in 2015, two years ago, Hexacorn uh, published a list of over 800 names of uh, antivirus sandboxes. Uh, and our list uh, coincided uh, with the Hexacorn long list in seven cases. So seven out of the 37 names are ones that were in that were known to be sandbox, uh, uh, antivirus sandbox computer names in 2015. So we see that this world is slowly changing, uh, and, but on the other hand, that in some cases, it did not change for over two years. And here's an example of the environment variables from a particular uh, Komodo sandbox machine. Uh, this machine does not make any attempt to uh, hide its MAC address, disk volume number, or domain, which remains static throughout multiple executions on that particular machine. But had it actually tried to randomize the MAC address, disk volume number, and domain, we'd still be able to detect it. How? Because we have uh, some uh, environment variables that are interconnected on that are re related um, so for example or in, in this case so there are actually two representations of the present time in the left hand side of the uh, 
bottom uh, uh, bullets. One uses a human readable format with three uh, environment variables, uh, temp h, temp m, and temp s, representing hours, minutes, and seconds. And the other one is this T now, which is the seconds since midnight. So these two represent actually the same quantity, the time of day, in two different ways. So if we find a machine that has this combination of uh, environment variables, we can tell that this is the Komodo uh, sandbox. Likewise, we have uh, another set of uh, environment variables that represent the time plus 202 seconds. Not sure what this magic number represents, but possibly a time limit for a sandbox execution. And again, two representations of the same time. And again, uh, enabling us to detect this uh, sandbox as a Komodo uh, sandbox, uh, even if the uh, obvious MAC address, disk uh, volume number and domain are randomized. We kept talking about uh, cloud sandboxes, but in fact, this research also applies to on-premise antivirus sandboxes, uh, which are considered a more secure alternative to cloud antivirus sandboxes. But if those on-premise antivirus sandboxes allow uh, internet connections, and the enterprise firewall also allows internet connections, or, or the subsets, two subsets of internet connections that has that have non-empty intersection, then uh, the satellite can abuse this uh, non-empty intersection to exfiltrate data through the internet uh, ports or protocols that are allowed both by the sandbox and by the corporate firewall uh, and achieve the exfiltration. We did not test this, but uh, we assume that there are some systems out there that uh, are vulnerable to the attack. To generalize what uh, we just uh, described, you can think that you, you can actually say that any sample sharing outside the enterprise, or in case of on premise sandbox, even inside the enterprise, can facilitate exfiltration. So we should be wary of security mailing lists and file or sample repositories or expert analysis services if we provide them with executables from our enterprise. We can, by that action, facilitate exfiltration. And particularly when we are looking at the uh, submission to Virus Total and Friends, uh, this uh, becomes a, 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 real, uh, a real problem. Uh, if such services, if online or cloud sandbox or scanning services are used as a backend for uh, uh, malware detection engines, then this becomes a problem. And even, in, and of course, if uh, Virus Total or a Joe Sandbox or Payload Security products uh, services. I'm sorry, are used manually. And obviously, uh, if this uh, if this sample we share happens to be a, a satellite type of sample, uh, then uh, we we actually uh, facilitate exfiltration. And we did manage to do that with Google Virus Total, with Joe Security Sandbox Cloud, and Payload Security Hybrid Analysis. So, for a little demo, I'm handing it over to Itzik. Thank you. So, as Amit has presented, uh, we have released a tool um, that basically I'm going to demo it. Um, the tool is Right now is already on GitHub, so once Amit will present his computer back, you can see the, the URL and download. Okay. Let's see. Cool. So the tool name is SpaceBin, and basically what it does is exactly what Amit described. We have developed two components. One of them is the rocket, one of them is the satellite. And I'm going to make a presentation here that shows exactly how it works. So the first time, what I'm going to show right now is a local simulation on my own laptop. So basically, this is a Windows 10 machine running within my Mac. And I'm going to compile right now a rocket and a simulation. And the purpose of that exercise is to lick the string a low DC25. 
So we are using Python basically to generate um, a C++ skeleton, and within the skeleton we embed the actual file, the actual strings that we would like to extract from that purpose company. Um, as, as, a, as a way to embed the information, we are using a magic number, so we not actually compile anything. The satellite, as Amit presented, the vanilla version, basically contains a buffer within the executable, which is then will be rewritten with the information once the attacker wants to extract it. So the process that happened right now, I've compiled the rocket. Sorry? Bigger? Okay, I'll try to make it a little bit bigger. Um, so we have compiled the actual... Um, hold up one second. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have actually run a Python script. That Python script generated a C++ file that will be the rocket. And we it, in it, we provided the string that we'd like to steal. That string was a low DC25. Obviously, as a POC, that's the purpose of it. It can be enhanced to do actual more files and whatnot. Again, in order to overcome the idea of how we will write the information in real time, we've allocating the buffer and using these magic numbers to basically know exactly within the executable where we can rewrite with the actual information. So the satellite, once it's executed, and here it's named um, TPP, um, has, is going to try a, a number of different ways to basically communicate outside. So the first one will be DNS, and the second one will be a bunch of different ports. So let's see that it's working. Let's see that I have an internet connection. Okay. And so basically for the purpose of this exercise, Amit and I, we have registered a domain. And this domain, we basically own the name server, as you can see here. And basically we have received this heat on our, on our um, tail, which means that we have actually communicated from my Windows 10 through DNS tunneling to our server. So just to prove that the information that is packed here is the same as we have um, initially decided, let's decode the base64 string and see what's the, uh, the output. Obviously, we need to make sure that it's padded completely. And as you can see, it's the same string that we intended to leak in the beginning. We have enhanced the tool ever since and we have created a, a version which allows also to try different TCP and UDP sockets, again, all for the purpose to examine what kind of information can be now stolen from the, the sandbox. Um, as Amit presented, there is two types of um, sandboxes. We're going to present a demo that we have recorded with virus total. So we're actually going to present how is it going to look like if somebody is going to use virus total. And I'm basically going to narrate it as I'm playing the demo over here. So as you can see here, we have a split for three screens. On the left side, the upper left side of the screen, we're going to basically bind a bunch of very common TCP and UDP ports from the assumption that if the sandbox is open, that will allow the information to flow through. Um, on the bottom, as you can see, we're going to tail our bind DNS service. And again, in the hope to see if the sandbox will allow the DNS request to go out. We are now compiling on the right side, that's the hacker point of view, we're actually compiling the, um, the same rocket as I've tested it on, on my computer. Here we're going to use a different payload. Now, stepping into virus total, that's the same website that you guys are seeing, the same website that you guys are using. I have no special access to it or no special mode. The rationale behind this particular demo is imagine that you're a threat analyst, a SOC analyst, there's some kind of a sample that you'd like to examine. Now you're gonna to go to virus total, you're going to submit that sample. So far, so good. Sounds like a very solid workflow. So I'm gonna do exactly that. I'm going to upload the created satellite into um, virus total and it will start processing. It will take about uh, a minute till it will actually uh, connect back, take into consideration the order uh, that these sandboxes are being activated, we cannot control it. As I specified, it can be seconds, minutes, or hours. Um, in this particular demo, it's about a minute. So as you can see, virus total is actually processing the sample, that doing what it's always doing. Now, let's put attention on the left side of the screen. Uh, what's going to happen here is that we're going to see information coming both on the, on the TCP UDP sockets as well as on the DNS. So let's let it run its course.
in reality, I spend a lot of time in front of that screen waiting for results to show up. I just shorted it here in the demo. Thank you, thank you. So what we're seeing on the left side is that virus total all totally allow connection to these different ports, anything from 6667 IRC all the way to NTP, 123 UDP, and other popular services. The string that I've used is a low black in 2017. That was our previous uh, talk, so we prepared the demo for that one. On the bottom side of the screen, we can also see hits on our DNS server, meaning that we actually also allow also, DNS tunneling is also a possibility to run from virus total. What I'm going to do now in the demo is I'm going to take, again, the base64 encoded string, and I'm going to decode it, and it was supposed to be the same string that I've sent in the beginning, which is the hello blacket to 2017. And that's that. So again, just to kind of quickly recap what we've seen right now. So what we've seen is a, uh, a malware contains another malware, and that the secondary malware will try to communicate out from the sandbox on two different methods. One is the DNS tunneling, as shown in the lower bottom of the screen, and then the on the try to create open sockets on regular services and try to communicate the string out. So back to you, Amit. Thank you, Itzik. All right. So obviously we informed the uh, affected vendors. Uh, three of them, Avira, Iset, and Komodo, fixed their sandboxes. I'll soon uh, explain how. Uh, in fact, Avira did that in less, this, less than half a day. Uh, Kaspersky, on the other hand, uh, opted uh, not to fix. Uh, they said that they offered several uh, workarounds, uh, but uh, they do not address uh, the uh, core uh, issue in their uh, offering. We also got, by the way, a nice uh, acknowledgement email uh, document from, uh, from ESET, so it's very nice of them. So that's about uh, antivirus vendors. As for cloud sandboxes uh, analysis services, uh, I should say that I should say very honestly that I, I, we do not consider the issue to be a, a, a vulnerability in their services. After all, the services are uh, um, not uh, committed to the to pre or, or not supposed to prevent exfiltration from endpoint machines, which are totally not in their jurisdiction. Um, however, we notified all three vendors. Uh, VirusTotal uh, told us that uh, internet connections are uh, needed for uh, are actually a feature it's needed for the analysis of the uh, of the samples. Joe Security decided to fix, and Payload Security decided not to comment. So what can a, a cloud antivirus do in such case? Uh, what we, the, the obvious suggestion is simply to block all traffic uh, to the internet from the sandbox. But we can be a bit more uh, delicate and, uh, just, uh, and only allow a sample to interact with the internet if the sample arrives from the internet. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that if a sample gets from the internet to an endpoint, but the AV agent know, knows that it's that, that the, the sample on disk is byte Y identical or MD5 or SHA2 identical to the sample that or to the binary that arrived from the internet, then it's safe to send it to the sandbox for a full internet access analysis. However, it's it, there's a subtle uh, issue here. It's not enough for the uh, sample to arrive from outside the endpoint. Think about an, an, an enterprise wherein the two endpoints are infected. And in one of them, the rocket spawns a, a sample, a, a satellite, and sends the satellite to the second infected machine. Now, the second rocket in the second infected machine executes the satellite. The antivirus looks at the satellite and, and, and figures that it's identical 
to the one to the copy that arrived on wire to the second endpoint. And so it's quote unquote safe for a full internet access uh, sandbox analysis. But that's not the case because the this, this satellite, this satellite arrived from within the enterprise and it may contain uh, embedded in its sensitive enterprise information. So the sample, the, the satellite, or sorry, the sample should arrive from outside the enterprise, should arrive from the real internet. And obviously, this suggestion does not apply to cloud scanning and, and analysis services like BiosTotal, who are clueless about the origins of the sample that's uploaded to them. From the offensive point of view, there are uh, some research directions that uh, we are uh, we identified. Uh, again, our research was conducted with some time and resource restrictions, um, but we do have some ideas where this research can be, uh, uh, where this research can be, or how this research can be extended. One is obviously to implement additional antivirus triggers. We are not 100% sure we managed to trigger all the antiviruses that uh, we tested in the lab. Another idea is to add more exfiltration methods. As I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, are, we only used HTTP and DNS in our research. Obviously, we could have tried SMTP, IRC, ICMP, and lots and lots of protocols and techniques to exfiltrate uh, data. Um, one thing that uh, can help the rocket to evade uh, detection or, or, or to evade getting uh, suspicious uh, is encrypting and or compressing the satellite, uh, the vanilla satellite that it carries inside it. Also, uh, when it embeds the collected data, it would be a good idea to compress and encrypt the collected data inside the uh, satellite. Uh, and finally, uh, a bit more radical idea would be to simulate the antivirus agent to cloud the server protocol. Uh, this would allow the rocket, the main malware, to submit the satellite directly to the antivirus server instead of having to trigger the local antivirus agent. And this, in turn, first uh, re relieves us from the need to trigger the antivirus agent, but even more importantly, can result in a less uh, uh, less conspicuous or, or, or less obvious uh, trails that something fishy is going on. There will probably won't be any pop-ups as the, we, the ones we captured a few slides ago, and maybe even less logs, or maybe with some tampering and, and some uh, uh, sophistication, maybe almost no logs at all uh, from this uh, submission, and so it's more evasive. To conclude this research and what we've uh, uh, seen, um, we summarize it in three points. First one is that antivirus products using internet-connected sandboxes can facilitate exfiltration, even when very strict restrictions are applied uh, or enforced on the endpoints. This applies both for in the cloud sandbox, which is the main object of our study, but also on on-premise sandbox. We generalize that and say that sharing suspicious or malicious files can facilitate exfiltration, unless the file has arrived from the internet and is unmodified. And this particularly applies to uh, uploading samples to uh, online or cloud scanning or analysis services like Virus, Total, and Friends. But also any sample sharing at large, sending a sample to mailing lists or uh, sharing it with uh, security experts and so forth. Finally, particularly for antivirus products, uh, Avira, ESET, and Komodo fix their sandboxes so that they no longer allow internet connections, so they're apparently safe. Kaspersky is presently known to be vulnerable unless, of course, its users use any of those uh, workarounds uh, suggested by Kaspersky. And with other vendors, we can positively say that they are uh, not vulnerable because we only studied a very small set of uh, triggering uh, uh, techniques uh, and uh, exfiltration techniques. Uh, but obviously, more research should be applied in this area.
And we'd like to uh, thank uh, Yoni Friedberg for his help in setting the Antivirus Research Lab. Thank you, Yoni, wherever you are. Thank you all for uh, uh, attending our session.